and welcome to Misconceptions, a program that is committed to rightly dividing the word of truth. I'm your host, Romul Gassain, and today we have with us Dr. Mark Harwood from Creation Ministries International. And Dr. Mark will be speaking to us about, the, about science and the Bible. I nearly stumbled that, didn't I? <laughs> welcome to the show, Doctor. <laughs> it's a great privilege to be able to be here, Romul. It's always good to start on this note, isn't it? Yes, that's right. <laughs> Okay, we've been going through these episodes and speaking about a number of different subjects. Uh, last time we were able to speak about uh, fossils and a fossil record. What I would like to speak about today is biology. Biology is a very important science. Indeed. It means a lot and it can also demonstrate a lot of things. Can I please uh, start off by asking you, what is biology? Well, biology simply is the study of living organisms. Mm -hmm. And uh, scientists who are biologists look at um, the environments in which living organisms live, how they operate, how the, the cells function, how the organisms function. Um, but also, of course, they ask the question, where did they all come from? Mm. And also, what is biological evolution? Well, biological evolution is an attempt to explain the origin of life through naturalistic processes. Mm. And perhaps the best known example of that is what Charles Darwin put forward in the middle 1800s in his book The Origin of Species and he described the diversity of living things as being represented by a tree, a tree of life he called it and his idea was that all living things commenced from some original primeval cell and then through processes of random changes acted on by natural selection over vast eons of time, slowly and progressively all of the diverse living organisms that we find in the world today came about. Mm. So that's, I guess in a brief summary, what you would uh, term biological evolution. Mm. Now is there a lot of evidence which supports biological evolution? Well, evidence is one of those interesting questions that depends upon how you interpret the data. A, an evolutionary biologist would say, yes, there is considerable evidence, but interestingly, all the evidence we see in living things can also be interpreted, and I think much more effectively, in terms of the Bible's record of creation in the opening chapters of the, of the book of Genesis, the very first book in the Bible. Mm. You see, I think biology really is uh, the most dramatic demonstration of God's handiwork in creation because we find in living systems absolutely fantastic detail and creativity and complexity and just remarkable systems and interoperability between systems making living systems function. Mm. So they really are extraordinary, a mm. demonstration of God's handiwork, I believe. Mm. It's an amazing thing, it's true. I mean, when you look at the vast world that is around us, when you look at the different landscapes, you look at the oceans, when you look at the different seashores, when you look at you know, the different variety of flowers and plants and so on and so on, you think to yourself, wow, what? this is extraordinary. It, it is. This is. It's overwhelming, isn't it? Yes. And, and often, you know, people can interpret that information and go in either one of two directions. Either that, you know, we've just had, we've existed for millions and millions of years, as you were saying earlier, and, you know, these changes came about. Or we can go back and say, wow, we must have an, an amazing God, an interesting God who designed and, and created all these things. That's right. And yeah. uh, a God who made a world full of variety. And I actually think that... Um, the Bible's account of creation is the best description for what we see in the world around us. And the reason I think that is that the more biologists now study living organisms, the more biology is really becoming like information science. Mm. Because if you want to specify a living organism, you need to have information, instructions, if you like, about how to make it. And l let me illustrate what I mean by that. If you wanted to make a single-celled bacterium, for instance. You could imagine all the uh, instructions about how to assemble the component parts of that single-celled bacterium as being written in a book. And let's say that you needed one book full of instructions to make a single-celled bacterium. Now let's imagine you wanted to make a more complex animal, something like, say, a horse, like we've illustrated here. Mm. Now we need to have a lot more information. We need 
information about making eyes, lungs, hearts, circulatory systems, um, and, and all sorts of other things as well. So the amount of information involved in uh, all the instructions for assembling a horse are much, much uh, more than the number of instructions required for making a single-celled bacterium. Mm. So the question that the evolutionist has to answer really is where did all the extra information come from? Mm -hmm. Because remember, the naturalistic story about how the universe made itself, apparently, uh, requires that organisms progressed, according to Darwin's evolutionary tree, from simple to complex. Mm. So to make that journey from a single-celled bacterium to a horse, you need to write many more instructions into the book, if you will, um, for holding all those instructions. Mm. And so is this somewhat what you've just shown us now, what evolutionists believe? Is this how they explain it? Well, evolutionists have to find a mechanism for increasing information. Okay. And, and the information is stored on a molecule called the DNA. Mm -hmm. And the DNA is an amazing molecule. But we have a diagram of it here. It's like a uh, two uh, helices that are uh, overlapped with each other. And between them, you see these straight linkages. These are called base pairs. And they are like the letters of the instructions which tell uh, the cellular machinery how to build the organism. And so when you look at those letters, you can imagine those as uh, being written down, uh, as we talked before, about forming a book. In fact, those letters are like beads on a string, in a sense. If I had a series of beads and I knew Morse code, I could write the letters, uh, say, help, uh, on a piece of string. That's you, right, You yes. could read it in the dark, you know, yeah. you sort of feel it. <laughs> um, so the DNA is a little bit like that. The, the way the coded uh, base pairs are arranged imparts information. Now, information is an amazing stuff. It's, it's, um, it's not the same as the molecules that make up the DNA. Just like the ink and the paper in this book is not the information, the information is imparted to me by the way in which the ink is arranged mm. on the page. So this uh, Bible is written in English so I can read it. But if it was written in another language that I didn't know, then I couldn't read it. It wouldn't impart anything to me. Mm. So I have to know the code. I have to know English, the English words and so on. So what you're saying is that the information would have had to come from you to be able to write you know, an article or a book? Absolutely. Okay. Information comes from a mind. Uh -huh. That's a very important point mm. because information doesn't just occur naturally in uh, the world around us through random processes. So the information on the DNA had to be written there in the very first instance by a mind. And I believe that's the creator God of the Bible. Mm. So when we look at this amazing DNA molecule, the amount of information packed into just one molecule of human DNA is absolutely staggering. You know. Uh, one molecule of human DNA has enough information in it to fill 1,000 large books wow. like this. Not just paperbacks, but, um, but large books. That's one molecule. One molecule That's amazing. of human DNA. It's absolutely staggering. Wow. Now, the naturalistic explanation of how all this information came about uh, is quite a challenge. Charles Darwin believed that it was through the processes of natural selection that an organism could progress from being simple to complex. Mm. But Darwin had no idea of the staggering complexity of, uh, of a cell. I mean, he had some idea, but he didn't understand it to anything like the depth that we do today. Mm. He didn't understand, for instance, the structure of DNA or any of those things. They're relatively recent discoveries. Mm. But it turns out that natural selection, in fact, cannot lead to novel information being added onto the DNA. What do you mean by that? Please explain that. Well, if you think of it this way, um, we, we remember we had that analogy of the, um, uh, the single-celled bacterium having just one book and a more complex animal yeah, needing yeah. more books of information. So you have to add information. Uh -huh. Now, natural selection actually uh, works quite differently. And perhaps if I could illustrate it like this. Let's imagine that these two little creatures we have here uh, dogs. I know that's a big step of imagination, but just bear <laughs> with me for a moment. And uh, these dogs have medium length fur or yes. hair. 
And let's imagine that the length of their hair is determined by just two genes, one for making very short hair and one for making long hair. So each of them has a short haired gene and a long haired gene, which means they have medium length hair. Now we can mate those two dogs and produce offspring in a number of ways. This first little guy, he inherits the short haired gene from each of his parents, so he has very short hair. Mm. These next two are a bit like their parents, they get the long haired gene and the short haired gene, so they have medium length hair. But this little guy, ah. <laughs> he gets the jackpot <laughs> and he's got the long haired gene from each of his parents. So he's a very Mr. hairy, hairy yes. little dog, right? <laughs> now, another step in imagination. Let's say that this little population of dogs migrates to a very cold country mm -hmm. and uh, land with lots of ice and snow and sleet and so on. Now, the short and medium length haired dogs will be selected against by the environment. How? Natural selection really works. Okay. It's an observable phenomenon. So these little guys will be too cold to be able to survive. Okay. So but naturally the long, they would die off. They will, okay. that's right. They're not well adapted to their environment. But the long haired ones, they'll be fine. They'll be mm. nice and warm. And before long, we'll end up with a population of only long haired dogs. Now, when they reproduce, they will always produce long-haired offspring. Mm. But can you see what's happened? You see, the information for making short or medium-length haired dogs has actually been lost from the population. Mm. So natural selection actually reduces information. It doesn't increase it. But remember, evolution needs increasing information to go from a simple organism to a more complex one. Mm. So natural selection goes the wrong way. And that's where you have the problem. <laughs> so Absolutely. So the, from, from a naturalistic point of view, you can't account for the diversity of life through natural selection alone. I mean, one of the ways I think I've heard scientists, uh, that is, you know, evolutionary scientists, explain uh, the increase of knowledge, they use this word called mutations. Can you explain that a little bit? Yes. Well, in fact, uh, mutations are now... Uh, regarded as being the primary mechanism by which small changes are introduced into a living organism. And uh, if those changes are beneficial, then natural selection will act on it apparently and that, that feature or trait then becomes locked into the population. And, uh, and so that's how evolutionists believe the process works. But the problem is, you see, mutations are actually copying mistakes. Mistakes. I actually wish they were called that, you know, okay. because <laughs> then we would understand better what they really are. Uh -huh. So let me give you an illustration. If I had this simple sentence, the cat sat on the mat, mm -hmm. and let's say I copied it carelessly and made some mistakes. Mm. Have I added information? No, it's just jumbled well, up. Of course not. I, yeah. you see, errors almost always delete or corrupt information. Mm. You cannot rely on copying mistakes to develop the encyclopedic quantities of information that we find in the DNA of any living thing. In fact, this was well recognised by Carl Sagan, who was uh, a very high profile uh, evolutionist. And he wrote this, mutations occur at random and are almost always uniformly harmful. Mm. It is rare that a precision machine is improved by a random change in the instructions for making it. Wow, that's very clear. Well, it's obvious, isn't yeah. it? I mean, I, I used to um, work in the satellite communications industry and I can assure you that if you made random changes in the instructions for assembling a communication spacecraft, you would not get a better product out the factory door. <laughs> You'll end up wasting millions of dollars. Absolutely. And uh, the boss will probably ask you to leave the job. <laughs> <laughs> Most likely. Most likely. In fact, um, Dr. Lee Spetner, he was uh, an Israeli mathematician and bioinformatics expert. He wrote a book called Not By Chance. And in that he said this, all point mutations that have been studied on a molecular level turn out to reduce the genetic information and not increase it. Mm. So copying mistakes cannot lead to all of the novel information that we require to be written onto the, uh, the DNA code. Mm. Um, here's an interesting example of a, a uh, copying mistake. This is a, a mutation called the TNR mutant. And uh, this mutation has switched off the instructions for making feathers on this little rooster. Now, if you were the chook farmer, you know, you'd think that was brilliant because now, of course, you don't have to pluck the chooks. <laughs> that's right. But if you were the rooster, I think you would have a very different idea, wouldn't you? Yeah, that's right. But the point about this is that 
that mutation has not added new information. Mm. In fact, it's deleted information. Uh -huh. By the way, um, just a science lesson here, the TNR uh, initials there are for a, t a scientific technical term, and it actually stands for a totally naked rooster. Wow, I'm sure that would be a, uh, a lot of uh, fast food outlets that would really enjoy a, <laughs> yes, a chicken right. that does not have to be plucked. That's so true. <laughs> so now it really shows that the information is sort of going downhill. There's it a is. reduction of information, not an increase. That's right, that's right. As a matter of fact, it gets mm. worse because there's a concept called irreducible complexity. And irreducible complexity is um, perhaps best illustrated like this. You could start with this bicycle, say, and uh, if you wanted to make it simpler, you could take some, some component parts off. Mm. Uh, you could take the seat off, uh, you could take the, be a bit uncomfortable. <laughs> yeah. You could take the mud guards off perhaps and, uh, and so on, but you would finally get to a point where if you took one more thing, it would no longer work. Mm. It wouldn't function. Um, another example is a mouse trap. A mouse trap consists of a number of different component parts. And uh, here we've got a picture of a, a mouse trap with all its different bits. Now, if we reassembled that but left a part out, as we've done here, uh, as you can see, we've left out the holding bar. That mouse trap is useless. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> okay, now if you tried to use that mouse trap, all you would get would be very fat, happy mice. That's right. right. <laughs> Lots of cheese you keep eaten. the problem, that's right. So the point is that until that system has all its component parts and is fully functional, then it's useless. That's right. It won't work. Yeah. And the same is true of biological systems. Mm. Now we find that when we look at uh, a cell, for instance, um, a cell is an incredibly complex organism. If I took a cell and expanded it to be like the size of a great city, I would see networks of uh, communication systems, transport systems, factories and power systems, and all manner of things happening. Um, and in particular, it's the, it, it has transport mechanisms built into it. I mean, is it really that complex, that intricate? Oh, far more so than that simple illustration. A wow. cell is staggeringly complex. Um, and there are so many examples of machinery in, in a cell which is irreducibly complex. Mm. Uh, one that uh, I can share with you is, is this device. It's like an outboard motor on some bacterium. Bacterium which um, have to be able to propel themselves around need to have a little motor. Mm -hmm. And so this little outboard motor is embedded in the wall of the cell. It has at least 40 completely different parts built of, uh, of, of proteins. It has uh, different types of parts, I mean. There, there are many, many thousands of parts going into actually making it up, but 40 different types. And uh, this is an amazing contraption because it's actually like an electric motor with a universal joint, and it drives this whip-like structure. And we've just got an animation of it here. Um, you can see the, the rotating action of the motor turns the flagellum into a wave-like motion. Wow. And that's what is used by the bacterium to propel itself around. Hmm. Now all you need is just one of those component parts to be missing and the motor won't work. That's right. So you cannot make a transition from a simple organism to a more complex organism through very tiny discrete steps. You have to have all of these parts all together all at once before the thing will work and therefore bestow any kind of advantage on that living organism. Mm. Now, is there any more examples of irreducible complexity? Oh, there are, there are examples everywhere. And, and in fact, some of the machinery in the cell is uh, absolutely staggering. Um, there's a little guy inside the cell called a motor kinesin. And he is a, a little transport mechanism that carries proteins from one part of the cell where they're, where they're made okay. to another part where they have to be employed. Where they're um, needed. Yeah, where they're needed, that's yeah. right. Uh -huh. Where they've either got to repair something or build something new or, or whatever happens. And this little guy walks along specially made highways within the cell. Now we've got an animation of how this works and it's really instructive to look at it because what it shows you is the actual component parts, this is based on electron microscope images of these things, the colours we're going to show you are just artistic, but the actual shapes and how the machine works are quite realistic. Mm. So let's have a look at the animation of this motor kinesin. Okay. Here you see all these 
component parts, these are proteins, being interlocked together to form what's called a microtubule. And along these microtubules, these little motor kinesins are marching. And here he comes, the hero of our story, and he's clutching a huge sac called a vesicle, full of proteins. Now the vesicle has address tags on it, which tell the little motor kinesin where to take this bag of proteins. You can see him walking along the microtubule here. He takes 125,000 steps to cover just one millimetre. Wow. So that's eight billionths of a metre per step. Wow. Now, what we've shown you there is greatly slowed down, just so you can see what's happening. But this is an amazing little machine. So just imagine if he was randomly evolving and um, he only got one leg. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> he wouldn't work, right? That's right. So you've got to have the whole of this machine. And by the way, the cell is not able to function without these little transportation devices within it. Like the highways. That, like the highways. Of, yeah, yeah. Where they've got to have the highways. Uh -huh. They've got to have the little motor kinesins. Uh, all of these things have to be there. So can you imagine how the cell would have formed itself in the first place? Mm. All these little motor kinesins might have been there lying about, but if they're not inside a cell, they're useless. So why would they have formed? Mm. Or if the cell formed without them, it couldn't function, so it therefore wouldn't live. So it has to be a working model to start with. Absolutely, and it's yeah. got to be all complete. So this irreducible complexity works at multiple levels through the whole of the cell for it to be able to even function. Mm. We often hear about you know, antibiotic you know, uh, resistance, these so-called superbugs, and this is supposed to be sure evidence that evolution um, you know, or an increase of information yes. actually does take place. Yeah. Uh, have you got anything to that, say about that? That, that, yeah. that is often served up as an example, and people say, what about these superbugs that develop resistance yeah, to yeah, in hospitals? And, yeah, that's yeah. right. Well, it's rather interesting, but the actual mechanism is not in support of the evolutionary idea at all. It's mm. actually based on a loss of information. And let me try and illustrate that, how it actually works. There's a bacterium called Helicobacter pylori, which actually is the, uh, the cause of stomach ulcers. Mm. And some people who discovered this actually won a Nobel Prize for it. It's quite common, that. Uh, well, yeah, it is, yes. that's right. But it's uh -huh. treated with antibiotics. Uh -huh. And the way it works is like this. So the little Helicobacter pylori bacterium, there he is, he actually has inside him an enzyme which interacts with the antibiotic which is absorbed through the cell wall. And that interaction produces a poison which actually kills the bacterium. Mm. So that's how the antibiotic wipes out the bacterium. However, some of these Helicobacter pylori bacterium are actually mutants. And the mutant form does not produce the enzyme. So mm. when the antibiotic is absorbed through the cell wall, there is a lack of enzyme to produce the poison. So no poison and he doesn't die. Mm. It's ineffective. That's right. So yeah. the reason these guys survive is actually because of less information. Mm. So if you uh, are prescribed a course in antibiotics to combat Helicobacter pylori, you would get a multiple range of, of, um, uh, of antibiotics to deal with firstly the, the, the main type, but also the known mutant types uh, will be identified. Now in a, in a hospital situation, uh, in a very uh, sterile environment, the bacteria on your skin will in fact be wiped out. And mm. so you'll end up with after a time, um, mutated versions of the uh, original bacteria, which actually are resistant to the antibiotics or the sterile environment of the hospital. Wow. And they're called superbugs, but actually they're not super at all. They're very frail and they only survive in that very particular Clean, environment. Yeah. And one of the best things you can do is get outside and roll in the dirt <laughs> and get some of the wild type of the bacterium back onto your skin mm. because they then very quickly take over. and the, They'll kill the weaker ones. Exactly. The superbugs will just die out. They're not really super at all. Uh -huh. They're actually mutated and much, therefore much weaker versions. Uh -huh. So outside of science, what does this mean? Well, this is important because what biology tells us is that we are amazingly designed. There is the unmistakable fingerprint of a designer in all biological systems. So we are actually designed, therefore, for a purpose. We're not just biological accidents over millions and millions of years. Mm. And the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, 
For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Mm. And you know, Jesus' disciples once asked him a question. They said, well, what is the work that God wants us to do? And Jesus said this, and we find it in John chapter 6. He said, the work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. Wow. So us being in relationship with our creator God is all about what we believe. Mm. So if we believe that Jesus is God's son, that he did indeed come to pay the price for our sin so that we can be in relationship again with our creator, then we can experience what the Bible calls the new birth. Mm. But it's not to do with what we do or might have done in the past or might do in the future. It's all about how we believe. Mm. Well, thank you once again for being able to explain that. Uh, we've had a good science lesson in bi biology, <laughs> but also a spiritual lesson. I think that's really important. Now, if people do want to um, learn a little bit more about this, where can they go to? Is there a resource which you can lead them to? There is indeed. We have a website, creation.com. And we encourage people to go onto that website. We can't cover uh, much in depth here on these sessions or even answer all of the questions. But if people have questions, then there's a search window on the top right hand corner of our front page of the website. Just type in the keywords you might have and that will give you access to thousands of different articles and items of interest that will answer your questions. Mm. So creation.com, that's the place to go. Excellent. Now, I mean, you've been doing this for many years. How many years? 20, 30 years? You've um, been studying this stuff? Further, longer than I would care to admit, Rommel. <laughs> <laughs> Here's the question. Has there ever been a shadow of doubt in your mind as you've studied these, you know, in maturity, that you would turn around and say, well, hang on a second, I need to go the other direction. What the Bible says really isn't true. It's just a fictional book. It really doesn't know what it's talking about. Well, I've come a long way from where I started. When I was a Christian in my early years, I used to believe that God used evolution to create. Mm. But the more I studied it, the more I found that that simply did not stack up. And for many years now, several decades, I have unswervingly believed that the Bible firstly is God's word um, and that we can trust what it says right from the very first verse. Mm. And I, I can't um, say how much that has strengthened my faith and encouraged me as a Christian. Because if I can trust this book with regards what it tells me about earthly things, then I can trust it with what it tells me about spiritual things, mm. about my eternal destiny. Thank you once again. It's always a pleasure to have you come here and share some of your insights with us. Now, I think this is really important because Dr. Mark Harwood is saying this as a scientist. So I urge you, I encourage you, I challenge you to be able to go onto the CMI website and check these things out for yourself. We pray and hope that you've enjoyed this episode. Please stay in tune for the very next episode and may God bless you. Goodbye.